Chapter 11 with Deja Thoris As we reached the open, the two female guards who had been detailed to watch over Deja Thoris hurried up and made as though to assume custody of her once more. The poor child shrank against me, and I felt her two little hands fold tightly over my arm. Waving the women away, I informed them that Sola would attend the captive hereafter, and I further warned Sarkoya that any more of her cruel attentions bestowed upon Deja Thoris would result in Sarkoya's sudden and painful demise. My threat was unfortunate, and resulted in more harm than good to Deja Thoris, for as I learned later, men do not kill women upon Mars, nor women men. So Sarkoja merely gave us an ugly look, and departed to hatch up deviltries against us. I soon found Sola, and explained to her that I wished her to guard Deja Thoris as she had guarded me, that I wished her to find other quarters where they would not be molested by Sarkoja, and I finally informed her that I myself would take up my quarters among the men. Sola glanced at the accoutrements which were carried in my hand, and slung across my shoulder. You are a great chieftain now, John Carter, she said, and I must do your bidding, though indeed I am glad to do it under any circumstances. The man whose metal you carry was young, but he was a great warrior, and had by his promotions and kills won his way close to the rank of Tars Tarkas, who, as you know, is second to Lorquus Potomal only. You are eleventh. There are but ten chieftains in this community who rank you in prowess. And if I should kill Lorquus Tomil, I asked, you would be first, John Carter but you may only win that honour by the will of the entire council that Lorquus Tomal meet you in combat, or should he attack you, you may kill him in self-defence, and thus win first place. I laughed, and changed the subject. I had no particular desire to kill Lorquus Tomal, unless to be a Jed among the Tharks. I accompanied Solar and Deja Thoris in a search for new quarters, which we found in a building nearer the audience chamber, and of far more pretentious architecture than our former habitation. We also found in this building real sleeping apartments, with ancient beds of highly wrought metal, swinging from enormous gold chains, depending from the marble ceilings. The decoration of the walls was most elaborate, and, unlike the frescoes in the other buildings I had examined, portrayed many human figures in the compositions. These were of people like myself, and of a much lighter colour than Deja Thoris. They were clad in graceful, flowing robes, highly ornamented with metal and jewels, and their luxuriant hair was of a beautiful golden and reddish bronze. The men were beardless, and only a few wore arms. The scenes depicted, for the most part, a fair-skinned, fair-haired people at play. Deja Thoris clasped her hands with an exclamation of rapture as she gazed upon these magnificent works of art, wrought by a people long extinct, while Sola, on the other hand, apparently did not see them. We decided to use this room, on the second floor and overlooking the plaza, for Deja Thoris and Sola and another room adjoining and in the rear, for the cooking and supplies. I then dispatched Sola to bring the bedding, and such food and utensils as she might need, telling her that I would guard Deja Thoris until her return. As Sola departed, Deja Thoris turned to me with a faint smile. And where to then would your prisoner escape? should you leave her, unless it was to follow you and crave your protection, and ask your pardon for the cruel thoughts she has harboured against you these past few days. You are right, I answered. There is no escape for either of us unless we go together. I heard your challenge to the creature you call Tars Tarkas, and I think I understand your position among these people. But what I cannot fathom is your statement that you are not of Barsoom. 
In the name of my first ancestor, then, she continued, where may you be from? You are like unto my people, and yet so unlike. You speak my language, and yet I heard you tell Tars Tarkas that you had but learned it recently. All Barsoomians speak the same tongue from the ice-clad south to the ice-clad north, though their written languages differ. Only in the Valley Dor, where the river Is empties into the lost sea of Chorus, is there supposed to be a different language spoken, and except in the legends of our ancestors, there is no record of a Barsoomian returning up the river Is from the shores of Chorus in the Valley of Dor. Do not tell me that you have thus returned. They would kill you horribly anywhere upon the surface of Barsoom if that were true. Tell me it is not. Her eyes were filled with a strange, weird light. Her voice was pleading, and her little hands, reached up upon my breast, were pressed against me, as though to wring a denial from my very heart. I do not know your customs, Dejah Thoris, but in my own Virginia... A gentleman does not lie to save himself. I am not of Dor. I have never seen the mysterious Is. The lost sea of Chorus is still lost so far as I am concerned. Do you believe me? And then it struck me suddenly that I was very anxious that she should believe me. It was not that I feared the results which would follow a general belief that I had returned from the Barsoomian heaven or hell or whatever it was. Why was it then? Why should I care what she thought? I looked down at her, her beautiful face upturned, and her wonderful eyes opening up the very depth of her soul. And as my eyes met hers, I knew why, and I shuddered. A similar wave of feeling seemed to stir her. She drew away from me with a sigh, and with her earnest, beautiful face turned up to mine, she whispered, I believe you, John Carter. I do not know what a gentleman is, nor have I ever heard before of Virginia. But on Barsoom no man lies. If he does not wish to speak the truth, he is silent. Where is this Virginia your country, John Carter? She asked, and it seemed that this fair name of my fair land had never sounded more beautiful than as it fell from those perfect lips. On that far gone day. I am of another world, I answered, the great planet Earth, which revolves about our common sun, and next within the orbit of your Barsoom, which we know as Mars. How I came here I cannot tell you, for I do not know, but here I am, and since my presence has permitted me to serve Dejah Thoris, I am glad that I am here. She gazed at me with troubled eyes, long and questioningly, that it was difficult to believe my statement I well knew, nor could I hope that she would do so however much I craved her confidence and respect. I would much rather not have told her anything of my antecedents, but no man could look into the depth of those eyes and refuse her slightest behest. Finally she smiled, and rising said, I shall have to believe even though I cannot understand. I can readily perceive that you are not of the Barsoom of today. You are like us, yet different. But why should I trouble my poor head with such a problem, when my heart tells me that I believe because I wish to believe? It was good logic, good, earthly, feminine logic, and if it satisfied her, I certainly could pick no flaws in it. As a matter of fact, it was about the only kind of logic that could be brought to bear upon my problem. We fell into a general conversation then, asking and answering many questions on each side. She was curious to learn of the customs of my people and displayed a remarkable knowledge of events on earth. When I questioned her closely on this seeming familiarity with earthly things, she laughed and cried out, Why? Every schoolboy on Barsoom knows the geography and much concerning the fauna and flora as well as the history of your planet fully as well as of his own. Can we not see everything which takes place upon Earth as you call it? 
Is it not hanging there in the heavens in plain sight? This baffled me, I must confess, fully as much as my statements had confounded her. And I told her so. She then explained in general the instruments her people had used and been perfecting for ages, which permit them to throw upon a screen a perfect image of what is transpiring upon any planet and upon many of the stars. These pictures are so perfect in detail that when photographed and enlarged, objects no greater than a blade of grass may be distinctly recognized. I afterward in Helium saw many of these pictures, as well as the instruments which produced them. If, then, you are so familiar with earthly things, I asked, why is it that you do not recognize me as identical with the inhabitants of that planet? She smiled again, as one might in bored indulgence of a questioning child. Because, John Carter, she replied, nearly every planet and star, having atmospheric conditions at all approaching those of Barsoom, shows forms of animal life almost identical with you and me. And further, earth men, almost without exception, cover their bodies with strange, unsightly pieces of cloth, and their heads with hideous contraptions, the purpose of which we have been unable to conceive while you, when found by the Tharkian warriors, were entirely undisfigured and unadorned. The fact that you wore no ornaments is a strong proof of your unbarsoomian origin, while the absence of grotesque coverings might cause a doubt as to your earthliness. I then narrated the details of my departure from the earth, explaining that my body there lay fully clothed in all the, to her, strange garments of mundane dwellers. At this point, Sola returned with our meagre belongings and her young Martian protégé, who, of course, would have to share the quarters with them. Sola asked us if we had had a visitor during her absence, and seemed much surprised when we answered in the negative. It seemed that as she had mounted the approach to the upper floors where our quarters were located, she had met Sarkoja descending. We decided that she must have been eavesdropping, but as we could recall nothing of importance that had passed between us, we dismissed the matter as of little consequence, merely promising ourselves to be warned to the utmost caution in the future. Deja Thoris and I then fell to examining the architecture and decorations of the beautiful chambers of the building we were occupying. She told me that these people had presumably flourished over a hundred thousand years before. They were the early progenitors of her race, but had mixed with the other great race of early Martians, who were very dark, almost black, and also with the reddish-yellow race which had flourished at the same time. These three great divisions of the higher Martians had been forced into a mighty alliance, as the drying up of the Martian seas had compelled them to seek the comparatively few and always diminishing fertile areas, and to defend themselves under new conditions of life against the wild hordes of green men. Ages of close relationship and intermarrying had resulted in the race of red men, of which Deja Thoris was a fair and beautiful daughter. During the ages of hardships and incessant warring between their own various races, as well as with the green men, and before they had fitted themselves to the changed conditions, much of the high civilization and many of the arts of the fair-haired Martians had become lost. But the red race of today has reached a point where it feels that it has made up in new discoveries and in a more practical civilization for all that lies irretrievably buried with the ancient Barsoomians beneath the countless intervening ages. These ancient Martians had been a highly cultivated and literary race, but during the vicissitudes of those trying centuries of readjustment to new conditions, not only did their advancement and production cease entirely, but practically all their archives, records and literature were lost. Deja Thoris related many interesting facts and legends concerning this lost race of noble and kindly people. She said that the city in which we were camping was supposed to have been a centre of commerce and culture known as Korad. It had been built upon a beautiful natural harbour, 
landlocked by magnificent hills. The little valley on the west front of the city, she explained, was all that remained of the harbour, while the pass through the hills to the old sea bottom had been the channel through which the shipping passed up to the city's gates. The shores of the ancient seas were dotted with just such cities, and lesser ones, in diminishing numbers, were to be found converging toward the centre of the oceans, as the people had found it necessary to follow the receding waters until necessity had forced upon them their ultimate salvation. The so-called Martian Canals We had been so engrossed in exploration of the building and in our conversation that it was late in the afternoon before we realised it. We were brought back to a realization of our present conditions by a messenger bearing a summons from Lorquas Potomal directing me to appear before him forthwith, bidding Deja Thoris and Sola farewell, and commanding Wula to remain on guard. I hastened to the audience chamber, where I found Lorquas Potomal and Tars Tarkas seated upon the rostrum.